Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. Okay, so the rain wasn't here very long, but South Texas felt the extra large splash and dash showers blow through South Texas this afternoon. A good dose of heavy rain throughout the area. Now this video coming to us from South Bandera County, a good steady rain there measuring about three quarters of an inch. But when the rain moved on, it took the power with it, but that outage didn't last too long. The rain did clear out just in time for a big show at the Alamo Dome tonight. Bad Bunny fans multiplying by the thousands outside to see the Latin Trap rapper, who is one of the biggest stars in the world right now. Yeah, this is the north side of the dome. The line wraps all the way around to the south side. The show expected to start at 7 o'clock. People are showing up early to make sure they don't miss anything. More than 50,000 people expected to be inside the dome for tonight's concert. Thousands more leaving from the downtown area trying to get home, creating a big time heavy traffic situation. So what does it look like out there right now? Well, Here's your answer. <laughs> Let's take a look at this view. I-37 at Houston here. You can see traffic is one lane down at this hour, but we know with those tens of thousands of people coming to the Alamo Dome, the city did expect traffic to be an issue. So something to keep in mind, whether you're headed there or home using this route. Yeah, a lot heavier traffic than when we checked in at the same camera an hour ago. By the way, the show doesn't start until 7, so if you're coming to the show, you don't want to get caught up in all that traffic, you might want to take advantage of Via's park and ride, Via allowing people to park at the AT&T Center or at Crossroads Mall. They can take a VIA bus to the Alamo Dome and then back when the concert is over. All for just $2.60 for round trips. 54,000 people again expected at that concert tonight. And many of those concert goers also coming in from out of town, which means big business for the Alamo Dome and the city. This highly anticipated concert expected to generate millions of dollars. RJ Marquez live there with more of those numbers on what's expected from all of this and fans who traveled miles to see this show. Yeah, that's right, Stephen Myra. So you guys mentioned that one side of the dome that earlier, the north side. We are now here at the plaza level at the southeast box office. And I'm going to pan away here, our photojournalist Adam Higgins, to show just the line of people that are starting to enter the Alamo Dome right now as doors opened a little while ago around 530. This concert gets going at 7 o'clock. But a lot of these people here, a lot of these concert goers that we spoke to earlier today lined up to get merchandise, things of that nature. Well, they were from out of town, actually from out of state. Some people from South Texas, from the valley, from the border area, and again, they are just excited to be here for this very, very highly anticipated concert. So Richard Oliver, he works with the city's convention and sports facilities, said that during the last big concert at the Dome, which was the Motley Crue and Def Leppard show, the amount spent per person was $52 for concessions and merchandise, but that did not include any hotel stay, restaurants, or other spending around the city. So people coming in from out of town will likely add to that total and here's what a few had to say this was the only place we found tickets because they were all selling out so we got these and we, we just took advantage of it i flew in this morning and then i fly out at five in the morning wow yeah. so you're spending the night here not in the airport probably so i think i'm about to spend like 300 uh shirts socks and that's about it shirts and socks All right, so obviously there are people ready to spend money and have a good time here at this concert. So it will take some time to determine the overall impact of this concert. But just to compare a little bit, last December's Alamo Bowl had a similar attendance to this, 54, 55,000, and that generated 44, $45 million. So the Dome just to also announced that the Royal Rumble will be here in late January, and that's going to bring in a similar audience, a very international audience, and a lot of people from out of state for that big event. So Steve and Myra, there's a lot of buzz here going on with Bad Bunny, so things are about to get hopping here in just a little bit. Back to you guys at the studio. Hopping. Get hopping. I Bad see Bunny. what he did there. Those are some dedicated RJ. fans. Thanks, RJ. No, at six, they didn't want to haul away their trash, so instead they were hauled in on charges. Bear County announcing today that two people have been arrested for illegal dumping in the Camelot 2 neighborhood. Garrett Berger talked with the Environmental Services Department about what they're doing to fight a nuisance that affects people countywide. Trash bags, furniture, and all manner of filth heaped in this back alley in the Camelot 2 neighborhood. And it's very disgusting because of the smell, the rats, 
and people do it all the time. The neighborhood as a whole is a known problem spot for dumping. In June, the county posted this surveillance video of people throwing out trash and talking it too. At least three people were arrested on misdemeanor charges of illegal dumping related to that case. And in a separate case, the county announced this week two others had been arrested too. After a driver passing by snapped photos of them ditching mattresses and box springs. One of them, Larry Williams, was hit with a state jail felony charge because investigators say he runs a business. We've had several arrests in the recent recent history um, and we have noticed a, a market, marked difference in the um, illegal dumping. But in Bear County, it, it is a pretty, pretty severe issue that we're addressing. Cameras out in the open, like this one by Montgomery Elementary, where we met Dory's, are meant as a deterrent, while the county's hidden ones catch people in the act. Like the folks from the video in June, and now this man caught adding to the pile in the alley behind Soto's house. Environmental investigators say they've been able to get a warrant for at least one person who's been caught dumping here. And when they arrest them, they hope that sends a message to others. But the county's approach isn't just cuffing people. It also has trash service with special rates in five neighborhoods, including Camelot 2, a program it's looking to expand in the future. We have information on how to sign up on our website, ksat.com. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. San Antonio police still looking for the suspect who shot a woman in the chest on the southeast side early this morning. Detectives say the woman and a man were involved in some sort of domestic dispute when that shooting happened in the 3400 block of East South Cross. The woman was taken to a hospital and police say the man sped off in a white crown Victoria. After two months on the run, on the run a suspect in a Seguin murder is in custody in Seguin. Norman Trey Powell accused of killing 50-year-old Gregory Roundtree during an argument on July 2nd. When police arrived at the scene, they found Roundtree still alive with a gunshot wound, but he later died at the hospital. Powell arrested by Seguin police yesterday. His bond set at half a million dollars. New at 6, it is National Suicide Prevention Week, so we're looking closely at the numbers. Suicide numbers have dropped in the United States over the past few years, but they're spiking in one certain age group. Courtney Friedman brings us the stories of survivors who are now spending their time creating programs for the young people who are struggling. I lost my father to suicide in 2010. Greg Watson was 21 at the time. I ended up kind of turning to my own self-medication and grief um, and it was difficult to get outside of that. He realizes now he didn't have to grieve alone and is making sure others see that. He's a board member for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention or AFSP here in San Antonio. Really feeling that sense of community and connection is important. Suicide is the 11th leading cause of death in Texas and Bear County, but it's the second leading cause of death for people aged 10 to 34. What is alarming to your point is that in Bear County and in Texas in general, it's actually the second leading cause of death for those aged 10 to 34. Local AFSP chair Julia Hewitt knows that firsthand. She attempted suicide when she was in that age group. I grew up with a parent that struggled continuously, still still does. I also suffered a, a loss of a close friend and um, it definitely leaves you with more questions than answers. Trying to find those answers may take professional help and that's okay. She hopes people will use the many popular programs AFSP has created. And if you're not the type of person comfortable with getting out and going to a therapy session, the good news is there are tons of apps that you can use on your phone or computer. Hewitt and Watson are both thrilled about the brand new three digit suicide helpline 988, simplifying the process of reaching out during a crisis. Giving yourself that grace, but getting outside of your comfort zone. Knowing there are people just like you ready to help you heal. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Now, if you or someone you know is struggling and you want help, head to the AFSP website or dial that number 988. New at six, heavy rain drenched much of the state of Coahuila in northern Mexico last week. Not only did Ciudad Acuna and Piedras Negras see severe flooding, but also the smaller communities beyond those border cities. Jesse Degriado tells us a San Antonio woman couldn't just watch from afar and not help. After all, that's her home. Small towns south of Piedras Negras were underwater when nearby rivers overflowed after torrential rains last week. It just wouldn't stop raining. 
Like they weren't expecting that much rain. Raised in the U.S. but born in one of those devastated towns, Rose Garza says she felt she had to help somehow. Just wanted to um, do something for the people in need. People whose faith in God is all that remains. The mayor of Musqui, Coahuila, says 70% of its population lost everything. Everything that they've had in their life. Garza says her family also suffered, but at least they're safe. With so many left with nothing, Garza says she's trying to organize a relief effort on social media for the victims. She doesn't have a drop-off location yet, but she does have volunteers willing to take the donations across the border. The Mexican consulate is one of several places here in San Antonio. Rose Garza hopes will be able to help her in helping flood victims. Thank God we're doing good here, she says, but we need to help the people of Mexico. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. To find out more about the relief effort she's trying to organize, we're going to tell you how you can contact Rose Garza on our website, KSAT.com. Take a look outside with live cam right now. Things looking much drier than they were earlier, but it was nice to hear and see that good soaking rain for some, Adam. Yeah, and it came down hard for a bit, especially parts of downtown and the far west side of San Antonio. Now, there's some lingering shower activity far to the west. Uh, it's nowhere near San Antonio. Our skies have cleared out for now, but there's still the off chance of some redevelopment, particularly north of town. But you look at what's out there right now, just outside of Crystal City, Zavala County, a little bit of action. A little bit of lightning with that downpour that's headed to the south-southwest. It may just clip parts of Crystal City, but I think for the most part miss it. Otherwise, nothing locally, but I mentioned before, there could be some more development to the north. There's that off chance of seeing some of this leftover activity move our way. We're going to talk about rainfall totals and accumulations in just a bit. We're in Frio County in the small town of Derby who's been without running water for at least a month. The people who live here say they've been dealing with that problem for much longer. They've been getting water delivered to this church, but the pastor says they haven't had deliveries in the last two to three weeks. They're completely wiped out, and now people are having to rely on buying their own. Tonight on the Night Beat, we go inside the home of one family who's running out of water, money, and doesn't know how much longer they can survive. And donations have brought in more than $16 million available for Uvalde victims, families, and survivors. Tonight, the process to spread that money out to those who really need it. It's coming up on the Night Beat at 10. New at 6, you know all that cleaning and sanitizing you've done for the last two years? Well, now, apparently the hygiene hypothesis is taking over. Those germs we kept at bay with bleach and hand sanitizer may now be at work interrupting the body's natural defense systems. Ursula Perry takes a look at the research into a definitive link between the increase in allergies we're seeing now and all that COVID antibacterial cleaning. Antibacterial soap for our hands, antimicrobial cleanser for our surfaces. Uh, these were among our COVID fighting game changers. But is there such a thing as too clean? What we're seeing right now is definitely there is an uptick in, in both food and environmental allergies. Dr. Stephen Dennitz is a pediatric allergist who regularly gives talks about the long running hygiene hypothesis. With cleaner environments, antibacterial soaps, that we are not getting exposed to the appropriate levels of allergens in the environment. That means, especially for kids, their systems don't have a chance to fight germs and build immunity. But is there a link between antibacterial cleaning, especially during COVID, and kids' desensitization to germs and allergens. I definitely think it's a valid concern. For now, the doctor tells parents to let kids be kids and not allow a fear of germs keep them from playing and interacting with others. So that way they can have the normal reactions to things in their environment. Here's why it's something for all of us to consider. While the environmental allergies are hard to track, according to the CDC, the rate of food allergies has increased by 50% since 1997. So what's next? Well, in addition to continual research in the U.S., Canadian researchers are studying the impact of the hygiene hypothesis during COVID on the human microbiome. That's the microorganisms that live on our skin and in our gut. And they're trying to determine if a decrease in the microbiome played a part in the severity of COVID infections. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. 
All right, let's check in again. Sky 12 over the Alamo Dome. <laughs> this crowd is growing. Look at that. Yeah. So some of the line is for, I think they're selling merchandise yeah. out of that one tent, but the, you know, and there's some other people going through security lines just to get into this concert. It starts at seven and the, the crowd outside just continues to grow. I know. Like RJ said, it's hopping <laughs> for Bad Bunny. I, yeah, we're going to keep these bunny puns. We're just, we're going to keep At least that, that one. That yeah. one seems apt right now. That's a, that's a good one. Yeah, I like yeah. that one. Yeah, these fans right. not getting rained on right now. That's for sure. That's that might have been earlier though this afternoon if they were lined up out there. Yeah, if they got there very early uh, for the concert, relatively speaking, then yes, around two, three o'clock in particular is when we had the heavier rain move through parts of San Antonio. We'll take a look at the rainfall totals in a moment. Just a small chance of rain tomorrow. Generally sunny and dry from tomorrow through at least the next seven days, and high temperatures staying under 100. I know we're used to 100 degree days uh, throughout the summer, and now. It's like we'll be in the mid 90s. Pretty steady temperatures for the days ahead. Take a look at our rain chances tomorrow. 10% chance then down to nothing. As for the rainfall today, we talked about what's lingering out there right now just outside of Crystal City. Lightning and thunder. If you're in Crystal City or Carrizo Springs, look off to the northeast. You're going to see that thunderhead and the heavy rainfall off in the distance and some flashes of lightning even within that. Otherwise, around town, we've cleared out a bit and activity has simmered down. A few lingering outflow boundaries east of us could still kickstart a few showers even off to the north of San Antonio. I think that's where we could see a little more action as the evening progressive progresses, but I think it's going to be pretty few and far between. There's still that off chance, though, still a little bit of hope, especially with leftovers coming in from the Austin area. All right, take a look at the 12 hour rainfall estimates today. Far west side, far south side of San Antonio really standing out, especially down into Frio County Pearsall area right along I-35. Over two inches estimated just outside of Pearsall, east of I-35. So you look locally, east side of town here, nothing basically between 410 and 1604. But then you go to the far west side and you're talking over an inch. And unfortunately, this one little hole of no rainfall, one little dome there over the northwest side, and that was generally the medical center area uh, where that happened. All right, so let's take a look at some of these totals. We're talking Alamo Ranch area, even near SeaWorld, between a half inch to an inch and a half. You see Military Drive, 1604. You go into the neighborhoods there, 1.5 inches estimated by the radar, but then at Warren High School, under a quarter of an inch. Obviously, a big difference over a short amount of real estate. Now, this is interesting here right along 410, just east of the airport, eight tenths of an inch estimated. But then you get into Windcrest and Converse, absolutely nothing. So a span of about five miles was the difference between over three quarters of an inch of rain and absolutely nothing. Unfortunately, that's what we deal with a lot when it comes to rainfall around here this time of year. Here's the satellite and radar over the past six hours. You see that activity rushing right through town from south to north. Still watching some action from College Station approaching Austin. We could get some of those leftovers, especially on the north side of town. This is all part of a little ripple right here in the upper level flow that's helping to generate these showers and thunderstorms. And actually, we caught some of this pretty cool time lapse there. This is from the medical center area where we really didn't get anything more than a few drops, but we could see the showers off in the distance officially at the airport six hundredths of an inch. So 0 0.06 officially at the airport for our climate data. 96 are high today. That's four degrees above average right now. We're 86, but it's sticky out there. A dew point of 69. It feels muggy, so it, the air the feels like temperature. The heat index is up to 90. It feels like it's about four degrees warmer than the air temp. And right now we're 83 in Pleasanton, 87 Kennedy, 94 New Braunfels, Del Rio at 90 degrees. Rio Medina, 77 Castroville, 81. Divine 85. I point those out because we had some rain move north to south in that area and it did impact the temperatures a bit. Meanwhile, New Braunfels at 94 and Seguin 92. So tomorrow we'll start the day at 73, make it up to 95 by the afternoon. Just that off chance, a 10% chance of an isolated shower too. Mid 90s for most of us. Poteet 94, Seguin as well. 95 for high in Bandera and then temperatures really don't change much mornings in the low 70s afternoons in the mid 90s and a good amount of sunshine from there on out through the weekend and even into next week. Now next half hour we're going to be talking about the tropics. There's a lot of activity out there. I'll give you a full update.
Okay, we'll see you then. Thanks, Adam. All right, they're about to take the uh, show on the road. They're favored. But they should be. They're the road runners. There you go. He just say head football coach Joe Trailer said today he violated his own 24 hour rule regarding that loss, the uh, triple yeah. overtime loss, by he said about 72 hours. That's how much it dogged him. All right, when we come back, but well, they are ready to move on and they're headed to Army. When we come back, more about that big game coming up, their first road trip of the season. And for Steve Sarkeesian, can lightning strike twice? We'll explain coming up. One thing the UTSA Roadrunners proved in their season opening 37-35 triple overtime loss to now number 25 the Houston Cougars. They can hang with some of the best in college football. Now this week they will get their first road test when they travel to West Point to take on Army as two-point favorites after they were three-and-a-half point underdogs to the Cougars. One of the things head coach Jeff Trader pointed out today is that the loss of four offensive tackles and having to make major adjustments on protection during that loss. Our plans for the whole night or to help on the left side. And when you get in the middle of the game and you have to now start helping on both sides, that's a whole nother protection that we tried to draw up on the sideline. And you could tell by some of the results, we didn't do a real good job. And that, I'm really mad at myself. We understand what happened last week and we just try to lead that in the past. You know what I mean? Like nothing that we do now can change what the outcome that happened last week. So it's best to just move on and try to change the stuff that we could change in the future. Control what we control. All right, kick on Saturday between UTSA and Army is set for 11 a.m. When the Texas Longhorn hosts the Crimson Tide of Alabama, be their first regular season meeting since 1922, with Texas leading the overall series at 7-1-1, with their only loss coming in the BCS Championship game in the 2009 season, 37-21. Today, they are 19-point underdogs, which is the longest odds to win at home since 1978, according to ESPN. After number one ranked Alabama beat Utah State 55 to nothing to kick off their season, and the Longhorns outscored Louisiana Monroe 52 to 10. This is not the first time UT head coach Steve Sarkeesian has faced a former coach. Coach. Back in 2009, Sark's Washington Huskies shocked Pete Carroll and his number three USC Trojans 16-13. Now he's hoping lightning strikes twice. You know, you're going against the number one team in the country, so it's always fun, even though people call us the underdog. So I'm, I'm excited about it, you know, going into this game, especially knowing the history and the last time these teams played against each other. So I'm excited for it. Chemistry is a big, a big thing for this team. Um, you know, I'll take t I'll take chemistry over talent all the time, every day. Because yeah. um, <clears throat> when you have that chemistry, everything kind of clicks. All right, we'll see how it turns out. Kick off at Royal Memorial Stadium, set for 11 a.m. Saturday. When the sixth ranked fighting Texas Aggies host Appalachian State, it will be a tough test for the Aggies' defense. That's because the Mountaineers nearly pulled off the comeback of the year in their season opener against North Carolina, scoring 40 points in the fourth quarter in the 63-61 loss. But the Aggies are coming off a shut. The defense, we preach and preach on we are family. So we got each other back. And Coach Durkin does a good job of making sure that we don't forget that we are a brotherhood. And, uh, his schemes and things help us be in the right place at the right time. So with that being said, uh, I do think it's definitely a song tether for a great start on the season. All right, kick off at Kyle Field Saturday, except for 2.30. While college football is king on Saturday this time of year, don't forget Saturday also marks Manu Ginobili's induction into the Naismith Hall of Fame, Basketball Hall of Fame, becoming the fourth Spurs player to enjoy that honor. Our live coverage from Springfield begins tomorrow at 5 o'clock, and the Bernie School District just informed us that their game against Antonian, which was originally scheduled for Friday night at Antonian, has now had to be moved up due to technical issues to tomorrow night at 7 p.m. in Bernie. Just okay. Just the latest update. Interesting. There you go. Thank you, Greg. We'll be right back. Welcome back. The clock is ticking for former President Donald Trump's legal team and the Justice Department to submit candidates to be that special master in the case involving thousands of documents seized from Trump's Florida home. ABC's Elizabeth Schultz has more from Washington. A deadline is looming for the Justice Department and former President Trump's legal team. Both sides have until Friday to submit candidates to be special master, an outside independent party that will review documents seized in the FBI's Mar-a-Lago raid. Federal Judge Aileen Cannon, a Trump appointee earlier this week, granted Trump's legal team's request to name the special master. The judge's decision putting the Justice Department's criminal investigation into the material seized during last month's raid on hold. The harm is that it's delaying a criminal investigation 
based upon evidence that uh, has been achieved pursuant to it, you know, it lawfully obtained search warrant. Attorney General Bill Barr on Fox News is now urging the Justice Department to appeal the federal judge's decision. I don't think the appointment of a special uh, master is going to hold up, but even if it does, I don't see it fundamentally changing the trajectory. I, in other words, I don't think it changes the ball game so much as maybe we'll have a rain, uh, rain delay. The FBI search of Trump's Florida home in August yielded more than 11,000 government documents, with more than 100 marked as classified. Many Republicans on Capitol Hill are siding with the former president. Senator Roger Marshall calling the raid an unequal application of the law. I think that there's more questions than answers, uh, so I would like to wait and see which re records have been cleared and which ones hadn't. The Justice Department is still reviewing the judge's order and has not yet indicated if it will appeal. Elizabeth Schulze, ABC News, Washington. To get to our KSAT Q&A tonight with City Manager Eric Walsh, and we're going to talk about the city budget. And of course, one of the big issues that has come up is the CPS energy rebate and what's going to happen with that. Will it be a rebate at all? The city manager joins us. And before we get into all this CPS energy talk, I want to know what stands out for you as city manager in this budget. Give me two or three things that people at home need to know about what's in this budget. You know, the biggest thing, uh, thanks for having me on. Um, the, the biggest issue for me um, are the, uh, the adjustments to civilian compensation that we have um, with over um, 7,500, 7,600 civilian employees that do everything from pick up garbage and uh, answer 911 calls and run the airport and mow the yard, mow the grass at parks. Um, the investment we've put into the labor force um, keeps us highly competitive here in our local market. Um, we do um, an awesome job at the city, and Forbes uh, recognized us as one of the uh, state's top employers, which is a huge honor. But you know, we we've got to be able to do those jobs day in and day out, 24 hours a day seven days a week. That is critical to me and critical to the million and a half people that live here. Yeah, making sure that this city functions, right? There are people behind those jobs. Let's talk about that shiny object that, that Steve mentioned, the idea of what to do with tens of millions of dollars in a surplus from CPS Energy. The city has talked about the potential rebates for customers using some of that money, not all, but that would amount to roughly 30 bucks per, per customer. Does that look like it's actually going to happen at this point? You know, Myra, the council's had two uh, work sessions to discuss that, and they'll have a third one next week. Um, you know, it's it's they'll they'll make a decision next week. I, I think there's pros and cons. I mean, obviously, from my standpoint, um, from a financial standpoint, uh, we saw one of our major revenue sources spike over 21 percent what we expected just in the course of about 75, 75 days over the summer. So um, from my perspective, it made sense to, to uh, recognize the extraordinarily high revenue we received. Um, at, the, at the same time, everybody saw extraordinarily high utility bills. You know, there's a lot of policy level conversations the council's having right now, all of them very good. Um, you know, I, I think it's important to note that the city has had a good financial year. Sales tax has been strong. Um, and if we weren't in that position, I would not have made the recommendation to issue a credit to all ratepayers. I'd have held on to that to make sure that we can keep services bolstered and employees hired. I want to talk about if that rebate doesn't happen, what the alternative may look like. We're going to take a quick break and we'll rejoin this conversation right after that. We're continuing our Q&A with San Antonio City Manager Eric Walsh, and I, I want to keep talking about the idea of this potential CPS rebate. If that doesn't happen, is there another plan that's being looked at at this point that would be an alternative to that? Instead of using that money, roughly $30 to give back to customers, how could it be used instead? So the other policy conversation the council's having is whether or not uh, there's an investment um, in additional weatherizations. Um, um, for those that may need that uh, work here in San Antonio. Um, there's a, a general conversation that the council is having about how do we start to mitigate the uh, urban heat island effect. Um, that could include, you know, how we deal with um, not only uh, the surfaces of streets, but also additional trees in those heat island areas. Um, a lot of policy level conversations like that. And th those are, those seem to be the two issues the council 
is discussing right now, and uh, we'll see where they land next week. That's what I was going to say. The vote is next week, is it not? It is. The uh, budget is scheduled to get adopted next Thursday. We've got a work, ske- a work session scheduled next Tuesday, next Wednesday, and then uh, vote on Thursday. One of the things I wanted to bring up that I noticed in the budget is additional police officers being added to the force. Talk about that a little bit. And there always seems to be obviously a debate between the union and the city on what the magic number of police officers are. How many officers are we talking about adding to the force? So the proposed budget is, uh, is includes 78 new positions. Um, and, you know, to the, to the question you have, Steve, about how many officers do we need? We, we've actually, we've actually hired someone to help look at that. I mean, as San Antonio continues to grow, um, and, and we, we will need to continue to grow the police force. Part of that is making sure we control expenses and public safety represents uh, about 60.7% of our general fund budget, which is the lowest it's been in some time. Um, and we've worked well with both uh, the police union and the fire union to maintain our, our control over healthcare expenses. And that's helped give us the flexibility to, to do things like adding. We're also adding uh, two fire units in the proposed budget, uh, 21, 21 firefighters. We will undoubtedly, as we continue to grow, we'll need to continue to grow both those departments. There is that study looking at staffing within SAPD. Also the UTSA study looking at violent crime prevention measures. Do you feel like as San Antonio grows every budget year, that's just going to be a, a given that more officers will be needed to add to that? You know, Myra, I don't know if it's necessarily a given. I, I think we do need to make sure that we're reacting to the service needs we have. I think we need to be reacting to making sure that we're keeping up with not just patrol officers, but maybe investigators and the closure of crime, traffic unit. Um, the, you know, the, the whole balance is what, what you can afford. And, and we can't spend all of our money in public safety. It is the major issue, one of the major issues that the public expects, but we've got to make sure it's balanced with all the other things that that we want to do from the park system to street maintenance to libraries. Um, So every year has got to be a balancing act. Undoubtedly, I mean, I I don't really need a consultant to come in here and tell me we need more officers. We probably need more officers. But how do we do how do we put together a plan that we can do um, and we can afford it over time? That's what we're looking for. I'm looking for a little bit of a roadmap. See what happens next week. By the way, uh, Mr. City Manager, I noticed the uh, Manu Ginobili jersey over your shoulder. You know, now it'll be a Hall of Fame jersey over your shoulder. So, right. you know, let, congratulations on having that in your office. <laughs> well, Steve, that's actually, it, it is Man- Manu's number, but I'm also the 20th City Manager. And I think ah, that's what David's about. Okay, so it's not a Ginobili jersey. Double no, meeting, man. We, we'll just say it's a we'll, we'll say it's a Ginobili jersey. How about okay. that? Let's All just right. call it a Ginobili Walsh jersey. How if we do that? All right. Fair enough. City Manager Eric Walsh, always appreciate your time and uh, we'll see what happens next week. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Take care. Thank you. We'll be right back. All right, another look. Let's see how the crowd is growing here at the Alamo Dome. We are 15 minutes away from the beginning of Bad Bunny. Or at least the show. I don't know if he's got, he's, there's probably an opening act, but. Oh yeah. Yeah, seven you know, o'clock you know is. It, that's how long it's been since I've been to a concert. Well, don't I, fall for that just, trap, Myra. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're, you're not as young as, you know, Caskey and I, so. Oh, is that what it is? <laughs> as okay. young and young and, as young and hip. Sorry, I can't even say that that with a straight face. (laughs) We we should go ahead and confess that we've had to look up Bad Bunny songs. A lot, yes. To familiarize ourselves. Yes, and and for the record, Myra, you're way younger and hipper than Kasky. That's true. (laughs) I don't know about that either. That's that's the sarcasm I couldn't get out. (laughs) (laughs) I understood it, but we just had to clarify for everybody else. Yes. All right, let's get right to the maps here. I want to take a look at uh, this KSAT Connect photo, which is through our KSAT Weather Authority app, and that's one quarter of an inch just east of the airport. I mean, we're talking a handful of blocks just east of the airport today. It's good to see that or half an inch. Did I say a quarter? That's a half inch right there. Yes, that's nice to see now officially at the airport only six hundredths of an inch, so not a whole lot. We still have some outflow boundaries 
farther east of town, moving through Gonzales County, approaching Luling even. This is along I-10. And then another one that's just outside of Seguin. Now these could still generate a stray shower or two and even saw a few little pop-ups very briefly around Hallettsville, but I don't anticipate a whole lot more from this. I am watching this action that's closing in on Austin. There's the off chance that some of the leftovers of this could make it down into some of our areas north of San Antonio. So we're talking San Marcos, Canyon Lake, Fisher, Spring Branch, maybe even Bulverde. There's the off chance of that. So just something we're monitoring for the rest of this evening, but nothing severe. We would just have maybe some lingering leftover showers. What's left over now over Canipa? Not a whole lot. Right along Highway 90, you see Uvalde in the lower left of your screen. Uh, this is another shower just missing Uvalde. They've been basically skirting around the city so far today. And then just outside of Crystal City, this thunderstorm, which does show signs of weakening, is gradually drifting southward just outside of Crystal City and farther to the northeast of Carrizo Springs. So that's what we have out there right now. In terms of rainfall over the aquifer today, really not all that beneficial. We especially want it in this purple area. And Red helps as well, the recharge, recharge and contributing zone. And we had some rainfall in those zones, but I don't think a whole lot to make a big difference in terms of boosting the rainfall. Whereas Alamo Ranch, far west side of San Antonio, even near SeaWorld, over an inch of rain estimated by Doppler radar. And I saw a few rain gauges showing 1.3 inches of rain from those downpours earlier today. There's some of that activity near Austin that came in from College Station area, and uh, that's, again, something we're watching right now. But all this is being caused by this little ripple in the upper level flow. Enough energy there with this disturbance and enough instability in our air to generate some of these pop-up showers. It's all part of a big upper level trough, which is just going to cut itself off and circulate over New Orleans for the coming days. But I don't anticipate we'll get anything else out of it. I do want to talk about the tropics. We have Hurricane K right now a Cat 2. It's been throwing rain up the Baja Peninsula and in parts of western Mexico. And this is going to just basically move right parallel to the Baja Peninsula and then throw some rainfall into the desert area of Southern California. So a unique situation for them. Then we've got Hurricane Earl, Cat 1, that's south of Bermuda. Hurricane Danielle, far north Atlantic, that's just going to stay out over the open water. Actually, both of these are likely to stay over the open water. No threats, but then there's a 70% chance of a new system developing with this disturbance that's closer to Africa and moving out into the Atlantic. So that's your tropical update. Nothing threatening the U.S. or even anywhere near coming toward us. Here's a nice time lapse, though, showing the rain really coming down out of those showers today. 86 right now, dew point is 69. It feels like it's four degrees warmer than the actual air temperature. It's light southerly wind at only six miles per hour. Uvalde's at 81, rain nearby, some cooler air, but then Rock Springs at 90. 92, Victoria, Gonzales 92. Around Bear County, we're generally in the 80s. And as we go through the evening hours, just falling through the 80s, then down into the 70s. Pretty quiet weather from here on out. Then tomorrow we start the day in the low 70s. By the afternoon, we make it into the mid 90s and then get used to this pattern for the next several days. No big changes. A lot of sunshine and highs in the mid 90s. Okay, thank you, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here is today's In Case You Missed It. It is Wednesday, September 7th. The discovery of a body is so badly injured, investigators don't know yet if it's a man or a woman. A passerby came across the dead person at the intersection of El Paso and South Frio streets at around 7 a.m. When police got there, they found the body had suffered major trauma. Police do believe foul play was involved. An overnight fire broke out just before midnight at a complex on Jackson Keller near West Avenue. Seven of the eight units have damage from the fire, smoke, or water. One neighbor told me that fire crews got here quickly and got to work putting out the flames which had swept over one side of this building. But everyone who lives here got out safely. East Central ISD growing. In fact, the district expected to double in students by the year 2030. To prepare, it's going to be depending on the passage of a $240 million bond in the November election. The money would go towards a number of initiatives, including new schools, facilities, the estimated tax impact, six cents per $100,000 of property value, or about five to six dollars a month on the average bill. 
Major wildfires continue burning out of control in California. Thousands of people under evacuation orders as the Fairview fire scorches at least 4,500 acres. Two people have died and multiple homes have been destroyed. And firefighters are battling more deadly flames further north. The South Dakota governor signing an executive proclamation making a seven-year-old boy the state's corn ambassador. Tariq, or the corn kid as he's known, he became a viral video sensation for clips in which he enthusiastically declares his love of corn. He accepted an invite to South Dakota's Corn Palace. He's even catching the attention of celebrities, Martha Stewart, even Kevin Bacon. Tomorrow afternoon, back in the mid 90s, about 94 in Converse, 95 in Hondo, 93 Canyon Lake area. We'll have a decent amount of sunshine, some patchy afternoon clouds with the off chance of a stray shower. We're talking about a 10 to 20% chance. That's it. Otherwise, rain chances coming to an end with a lot of sunshine in our forecast, but remaining below 100. That all time record of 100 degree days remains elusive. Elusive. I don't really mind it. Thanks for watching the news at six. We'll see you back here on the